Podcast, sponsored by The Big 98, Nashville's number one for new country and the home of The Bobby Bones Show. We're so pleased to have on essentially a super group. We've got three of the members. We have Michael, Rick, and Tom from Cimarron 615. Gentlemen, thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having us. You know, it's so funny, you know, we were talking before we came in studio to where a lot of our viewers and obviously listeners of music already know you guys from your work. You know, because you guys, all five of you in Cimarron 615 have your bodies of work, whether it be with Marshall Tucker, whether it be with Hank, whether it be with all the great songwriters playing with John Cash, Johnny Cash and John Carter Cash. You guys are like the backbone musically. How did Cimarron 615 come together, Michael? Well, uh, we, we were uh, brought out to L.A. for a memorial tribute to Rusty Young, our right. founding, uh, the founding member of Poco that we all played with him. And what an incredible artist. Uh, uh, the best pedal steel player in oh rock gosh. history, some would say. Yes. I'd say that. And uh, we worked up uh, a set of songs that were Rusty songs, some of them Poco classics, some from Rusty's solo album. Mm -hmm. And we performed in the Joshua Tree in the desert setting with a lot of other artists. We, were the, we played several ourselves mm -hmm. and then uh, backed up the other artists. And it went so well that by the time we were at LAX, we had a record deal. <laughs> That's kind of unheard of, and it's like going, and we were joking before we came in studio, too, to where you guys have been in the business so long and written with so many artists and done all these things. It's got to feel weird. I mean, really, Rick, when you think about it now, you know, with Cimarron 615, it's like, we've got a band. Everybody goes, it's a new band. It's like, no, not really that new. It was a wake-up call. Like Mike said, the fact that we were offered a record deal at this point, was <laughs> I'd, I'd tell it to my friends as if it were a joke, and they right. laugh because it seems so unfathomable, uh, but it's the truth, and it's just, that's exactly how it happened. Kirk uh, Pasich, the, uh, the owner of the label of Blue Elan Records, right. sent a five-group uh, email, and we got it at the airport. And we're all looking at each other going, I think we have a record deal. Yeah. Is it, is yeah. this, am I reading this right? Is this what it says? I mean, you know, and, and I was asking you, Tom, also, it's like between all of your individual work with working with songwriters and you guys have your individual tours with other artists and everything you do, are you going to be able to tour with this, you know, brand new distance album? And you guys said yes. Well, absolutely. I mean, that's that's really our bread and butter. You know, as much as we love making records, playing live is is where everything really starts to click for this band. And and it's such a blessing because, you know, like you said, when we got on that plane to go out there, there really wasn't any plan to do anything past this trip to L.A. Right. So we came back to Nashville with a record deal and, and we had to start thinking about, well, what's what's a record going to look like? So, you know, we go into the studio and somebody had the genius idea. Well, let's, you know, there's five songwriters in this band. Let's all do two songs a piece. Which is brilliant. Well, and the great thing about it is we went in on two separate, two separate sessions. The first session, five days, everybody got one song. So after that first week of sessions, we already had a pretty good idea of what the record was going to sound like. Right. So it makes it a little easier to make that decision about what song to bring in for the next set of sessions. I think to me, that's one of the reasons that the record hangs together as well as it does is because everybody got to make those decisions as to what to bring to the table and, yeah, and it's really cohesive when you listen to the album which you know i enjoy all the different tracks and we've got music videos i want to bring up also but you can hear the influences of poco you know that that rusty was so well known for you know in sky kings and everything else but also it's it's like an evolution of that sound you know, when you've got the mandolin, when you've got the guitar, the keyboards, the drums and everything, and the great harmonies that you all bring, you know, it's not like, it's not like a tribute band. It's, it's an evolution of what Poco might have been today. Yeah. And, and I'm glad you bring up the harmonies. That's one of the things that uh, I really learned uh, from recording with Rusty and Jack Sundard, who's not here, when we made, uh, when we started working together, they really, that's when I, it dawned on me when I was touring and recording with Rusty and Jack that that's what sets those classic bands apart. Right. A lot of bands play, a lot of bands jam, but not everyone commits to those four part harmonies. And that was our driving force on uh, the common denominator on every song. Right. And when you got all these great singers that can hit, we can double each other. It, it really was a blast. 
You know, and I was thinking too, it's got to be almost intimidating with the five of you, you know, and so nice to have the three of you here today, but it's like, but it's like you, you guys are all a powerhouse. I mean, you know, once again, you know, it's essentially a super group and the name Cimarron 615 was even derived from a song. Yes. You know, and, 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 you know, you talk about that. Well, we were trying to find the right name for our band because, uh, you know, Rick and I have both been involved with uh, various bands who were offshoots of the Americana alt country. He was in a band called Burrito Deluxe. I was in one called Brooklyn Cowboys. We had Buddy Cage and mine, Sneaky Pete and his, and we'd already been through all the, the pain of trying to name a band. Right. All names were taken, and we went through the ringer and went through the ringer, and had a few several names chosen but a lot of them were either jokey or just taken right and finally we realized that we wouldn't be here without rusty young mm -hmm. and poco and what was his most covered song rose of cimarron right and <clears throat> we were just like well what about cimarron 615 615 being the national area code and didn't really expect it to take, and it just went on up the, the trademark flagpole. It was a winner. The label loved it, and we actually come, love it now. Yeah, well, and I've got to ask you. Right I know, exactly, it's like, and, and I've got to ask you this too. Rick, you know, it's like, you know, working in studio, and you know, you've done, spent so much time in Cash Cabin, but this album was done at Treasure Isle Studio, right? Yeah, well, being a drummer, uh, uh, Mike actually did the reconnaissance work. He, he had worked there recently, and he said, man, this is a great drum room. We would get a huge drum sound, and mm -hmm. we do, you know, our roots are in uh, Southern California country rock. Right. Yeah and underlying rock, it does need to have a good drum sound. So it can be a rock record and set it apart. And God, Treasure Island, it's got a 30 foot seal in it out in the big room and the drums just speak. That you, you doesn't, I don't know how you, how you could mess it up. If you put one microphone on it, it would still probably sound like art. <laughs> so it, it just sounded brilliant. Mike was right. As, as soon as we set up in there, we knew we had the right room and, and Treasure Isle was just perfect for this band. It really, uh, in, in every way, it was, it's a comfortable place to record. Mm -hmm. The age of, of the studio also adds to it. You're, you're more comfortable for a place that's been lived in. Yeah. A whole bunch yeah. of other records have already been made there and it's everything's been moved around to where everything's comfortable. They, that now the couch is in the right spot. Yeah. Everything's yeah. sitting where it was going to end up. Everything's kind of feng shui by yeah. now. Everything's feng shui by now. There, there's a whole room for just Tom Hampton's gear. Yeah. <laughs> That's the truth. Really. Yes, Between be. the 30-foot ceiling yeah. area for Rick and yeah. then Tom Hampton's wall of gear. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's pianos and all those. Yeah, stuff. yeah, yeah. And, then, I mean, oh, and there's a corner for the mandolin. Look. Yeah. <laughs> Little, yeah. <laughs> So we, we were totally comfortable there. And, and not to mention the recording gear, the desk itself is uh, really, I don't know the brand name, but it's all really, really good stuff. That's amazing. Well, and I wanted to bring up too, Tom, it's like, you know, how did you pick, you know, you and I were going down the, uh, the gear rabbit hole earlier before we came in studio, but how did you decide what to use for this album? Because once again, you've got the country influences, you've got the Southern, you know, the California rock, and also there's songs on here to me that feel very bluesy. Well, for this record, it was more of a process of deciding what not to bring and just bring in everything else. Because, you know, not in especially starting out, because I didn't really know, you know, what was going to what, what be needed for which song. So, right. yeah, there was pedal steel and lap steel and dobro and a Weissenborn and a banjo and several mandolins and all of the things. And we ended up using probably about 80 percent of it. Wow. Well, and you can hear it on the album, too. And I think, once again, a great nod to, you know, all Southern California bands, you know, we were talking about Poco and the Eagles and all these bands, you know, and, and Sky Kings to where it's like that sound, I mean, the instrumentation is just correct. You know, it, it's never mm -hmm. too much, but it's also the right thing and it interlaces with the harmonies and vocals so well. And I think you guys have achieved that on Brand New Distance also. I just don't know how you narrow down the songs to 10 because that <laughs> seems like that would have been impossible. That, that we are gonna have more difficulty in that regard on album number two. <laughs> <laughs> well, especially as so well as this is being received. <laughs> well, because, you know, and I was bringing it up, and I mean, not to embarrass you guys, but I mean, the, the album, you know, is already being taken on so many playlists. Mm -hmm. I know that radio and everything, because people are looking for this kind of music, and there isn't anybody doing the new stuff like this anymore, except for Cimarron 615. 
it's, it's pretty fun because different little radio stations all over the world are taking different little songs. Yeah. But it's exactly because of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. But uh, we did, we put a lot of uh, uh, care into instrument selection. Mm -hmm. Originally, for instance, we assumed, uh, because it was new, that there would be actually more pedal steel on the record. But then when we right. were honest, enough's enough. Uh, you know, right. song, what, three I songs maybe? Mm -hmm. I think it was the right amount. But you know, also yeah. for me, and once again, being the music nerd I am, um, it kind of reminded me of, of uh, you know, Graham also. Oh, you yeah. know, to where it's like, there was elements of that when I would listen. I'm like going, yeah, I hear some of that in there. One, one of my favorite things that we learned in it is, uh, is uh, well, uh, first, High Lonesome Stranger, because Rick and I, we had done so much bluegrass, and we've also participated in a lot of almost their bluegrass. We knew that it had to sound real. Yeah. Yeah. And we made sure everything sounded real. Mm -hmm. And we were real comfortable. And, but then, I have to say, on Try Again, we weren't expecting a song with that kind of effortless, say, mid-'80s, Southeast rock, dare I say, REM uh, flavor. Right. But Tom and I are both that age, and it's in our blood mm -hmm. that it couldn't help it. And Bill Lloyd, of course, loved, uh, and he's an insight. We couldn't help it when we did Try Again, and Rick came up with the, the pop drums. That song happened in the studio. Right. We yeah. had a little version of it. Yeah. But when he rose to the drums in there, that song became... I think it well, and those are two of my favorite songs on the album. And obviously, we're talking about videos, too, and you already have one video out, you know, for High Lonesome Stranger. And it's like, and to me, that reminds me also, you know, of, of Hank Sr., mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. just kind of in that vein when I'm listening to that song. Well, that's uh, lyrically, when Mike Ward and I wrote High Lonesome Stranger, it, we were, it's in, in between the, the lines somewhere. We're, we're thinking about Graham Parsons and Hank Sr., both of them kind of dying alcoholic, uh, too young, right. and it's it's in those lyrics. That's it's on purpose that you, mm -hmm. you have that image. Well, and it's nice though, also to me, particularly for younger listeners, you know, that may not know the history that we do, to keep those people alive oh, yeah. and to keep this music in Amen. the forefront. Because you know, once again, Tom, I don't envy you on what you're going to have to take on tour. <laughs> to go to pull. It's like going, good luck, you know, because it's going to be a lot easier on Michael. <laughs> Backline B3, baby. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> that song, though, High Lonesome Stranger, we hadn't really settled on a sequence for the record yet, yeah. and we put everything on a flash drive and took it to a photo shoot. And that song ended up being the first one that kept coming out when we would hit play on. Mm -hmm. And it's such a perfect opener for a couple of reasons to me. One, everybody in the band takes a turn on, on the vocal. Mm -hmm. So everybody gets introduced to the audience. And in you can tell song. it. Yeah. And yeah, the other is it's it walks right up to the edge mm -hmm. of, of that pokey up, that poco lineage without going completely over it. Exactly. Because there are some people that could go, Oh, Rocky Mountain Breakdown, okay, I see what you did there. But you know, this song it, it, it's 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 a great song, it's got great energy, mm -hmm. it's you know, and, and like I said, it, it gives everybody a, a glimpse at everybody in the band. Which I think is such a a testament to the musicianship and the vocals and everything. And you guys shot the video uh, out at Cash Cabin, right? We did. We yeah. brought it right back home. So, so how are you going to up the with bar a, on with these? With a cash. With, with, with Joe Cash. cash. With, Joe, <laughs> with our, with his, uh, yeah. yeah. Joseph Cash did the, the directing and the wow. filming. And it, it's such a great video, and I can't wait to see more of the videos coming out. But, you know, the other hard part, and not to put you guys on the spot, how do you choose the next singles? We let the label do that. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was listening to the whole album. We were just like, you know, and you remember back in the day when we used to buy, you know, the vinyls, mm -hmm. and you're like going, okay, I've got two or three good songs on here, and the rest are kind of filler. There's no filler. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, but that's a problem. Yeah, yeah. Because then how do you choose which one to go out? Well, I'm, what's happening right now is they just now introduced it to country music radio, and How Long Some Stranger is only now even though it came out in January, right. it's only now actually becoming a reality. So all of those plans, right. that we, we already have a video for Try Again. We thought Try Again was the next single. We, that, it was a done deal. One's Great amazing. video. Done it. We did it. Ready to go. <laughs> and now everything's on hold because I want some stranger, and this is a good problem to have. Just moved 20 spots from the, yeah. up the charts, and we don't know what's getting ready to happen. So we're 
Oh, it's like we're still in But you know, it goes back to what we all grew up with musically. I think with the album, with Brand New Distance and with High Lonesome Stranger and, and Try Again, it's all that, to where it crosses genres just like our influences, yeah. just like all of your influences on the album, to where it can't really be stuck. It's like kind of like I always explain Americana. It's like going, that's an umbrella for everything that doesn't fit somewhere else. That's right. Mm -hmm. And it's like with your music with this, with Cimarron 615, it can really fit into Americana, country, rock, blues. You know, it can really hit a lot of different boxes. Yeah. We're really fortunate in that, you know, we did come from, you know, Rusty Young is the common thread that ties this band together because we all were either in Poco or collaborated with Rusty at some point. Mm -hmm. But this record, I mean, this record to my ears owes as much to American Beauty or Damn the Torpedoes or, you know, music from Big Pink. There's yep. a whole bunch of ingredients in this record that complement that lineage, but don't necessarily draw directly from it. I mean, having that fan base is a great problem to have, totally. but yeah, there, there's a lot of stuff in this gumbo that doesn't come directly out of that, that, that legacy. Well, and I think expanding that fan base also, because like what we talked about, you know, jokingly, you know, certainly with uh, different videos that have been shot over the years, and, and you know, we were gonna have Rusty on the show at one point to where, Poco was always that great band that just never quite made it all the way as compared to like an Eagles. And so what I think is going to be amazing is seeing you guys do these songs live on tour, you know, kicking off this fall. And I think that's going to really become a driver for people to go, oh, my gosh, we want more of this. That's right. And we're really looking forward to it. One of the great things about Poco fans, they are rock fans. They don't they. They don't appreciate when a lot of uh, the acts from that just play the same set all the time. These are the, the Woodstock generation, and right. they don't, they like, they love Bob Dylan and Neil Young because every show is different. Right. And they expect that out of us. Yeah. We're their baby brothers. Well, and, and also it allows you guys to where, you know, you have the added drum solo. Yep. Maybe That's maybe right. we go a little longer with the B3. Yeah. We have a little more steel guitar. It's like you can do that because they don't mind the longer want, form. Our fans fact, want the jam. We have they already been informed. <laughs> to, we have we already have. been given the orders. We've Why aren't you stretching out like you did with yeah. Poco? It's like, well, we're trying to do all the songs. We're, well, cut a couple of them and stretch out. <laughs> well, you and Tom have all those instruments up there, and you're just playing them for the song. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Duly noted. <laughs> Duly noted. Yeah, I'm just saying, you know, the, the next thing you know, you guys are out on tour with Fish and the Dead. Yeah. You know, it's like going, wow, we're on tour with Bob Weir now. Yeah. You know what's <laughs> uh, There's a little station in Appleton, Wisconsin, that's only playing one song off the album. It's called High. And we intentionally. Great song. Thank you. We intentionally recorded that. It was gonna, if there had been another Poco album, it was going to be on there anyway. But now, we, so we intentionally recorded it with kind of that Marshall Tucker. Allman Brothers, mm -hmm. Flavor, and The Dead, mm -hmm. obviously, because I'm a dead guy. Right, and right. and we, we did it, and we were there listening to it, and it was really good. It was really great. It was hitting almost. And then one night, and this is what you love about Nashville, Rick was playing at D's in Madison, and he had his, his buddy Jack Bruno playing drums with him. And Mike Daly and I were up there watching it. Mike Daly's a pedal steel player yeah, okay. with, with uh, Hank, and mm -hmm. he's played with a million people. And we're watching, it and we're, he goes, he just says, there's nothing like two drummers, is there? I said, no, and it's a sound that's in our, in our DNA. If mm -hmm. And that's it. the next day I called Rick and said, hi, has to be a two drummer thing. Do we get Jack Bruno, or do you just change kids? Go, and he made Rick's a second, second drum set and <laughs> just played <laughs> along to the first track so that it has two drummers on it. And it's subliminal, right. but it makes it authentic right off the bat. Totally. And then there are other stations that are seizing on other songs that are, uh, but that's the hippie one. Right. And then uh, I'm, I'm, I just know in my gut that Try Again is going to be picked up by some alternative yeah. station that some... I, I totally agree with you. And I think that once you guys are out on the road doing this in concert, too, people are going to be so wowed that all five of you, you know, in the band can play incredibly, have played with, you know, everybody in the world and can hit these harmonies live. Yep. Because, you know, without auto tune and without being in the studio to do stuff, you guys can actually do it. Wait, that's a no job. And, and delivering it live, not easy. No. Nope. Well, I got to ask you then, obviously with a brand new distance, you know, uh, the, the album is out, more videos coming out, obviously singles going out to all sorts of formats. Where's the best place for our viewers 
to uh, keep up with you guys on social media, to come see you live. I'm hoping there's going to be vinyl. We actually are oh, turning oh. in the we're turning in the masters for the vinyl as we speak. Um, but yeah, there's Cimarron615.com is out there. There's a Facebook page. There's Instagram. You know, all of the all of the usual things are out there. And is there going to be an extra sheet, Tom, just for all the instruments that have been that you brought into the studio? I mean, like a separate sheet for that. Uh, what what is it? The kids say these days, ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> I have time for that, Tom. <laughs> all that information is in the album, in the book. Right. There we go. There yeah, go. You guys are going to have to do a separate, you know, just video on that, Michael. Mm -hmm. Well, well I, we already had to practice the excuses we gave to our wives and girlfriends for why we couldn't <laughs> thank them in big... It's like, well, boom, by the time it's lap steel, paddle steel, right. mandolin here, yeah. mandolin Bazooki. here, bazooki. <laughs> Honey, I... There was no room. room. Yeah. Yeah. We had to... Make your fun a little. You'll thank them on the next album. Yep. Well, I'll tell you what, it's an incredible album, all the songs. I mean, like I said, so many hits. Uh, you guys are just amazing artists. I'm sorry the other two members couldn't join us, but it's so nice to have Michael, Rick, and Tom. Cimarron 615. You want to add this album to your playlist. Uh, go see them live when the tour kicks off this fall. You want to have it on vinyl also. Brand new distance if you're a fan of Poco, Southern Rock, even some bluegrass country. It's all in there. What a great album. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me thank on the show. Thank you. Thanks Thanks very much. Great Appreciate to be here. this. Sponsored by The Big 98, Nashville's number one for new country and the home of the Bobby Bones Show.